All right, everybody, it's time to do part three of the last part of muscle tissue. So last lecture, we left off with muscles are going to contract. And when a muscle cell contracts, that's going to be a twitch. And when we ask more than one muscle cell to contract, we usually recruit the muscle cells to contract by recruiting motor units. So we recruit maybe two or three neurons and all of the fibers that it controls to contract. And so that might give us enough contraction to, you know, maybe lift a piece of paper. But then if we need to recruit more motor units because we're trying to lift a textbook um, or a stack of books, we might have to recruit 20 motor units, so 20 neurons and all of the muscle fibers they control. And it's possible that if we get to a point where we need to get um, a muscle to contract all of the muscle fibers, then we recruit the entire motor unit um, population. Okay, and while when we ask the muscles to contract, and if we ask all the motor units to work in the same given second, we might be able to generate for that fraction of a second all of the muscle contracting in unison enough force to do something, but we won't be able to sustain it. When we look at sustained muscle contractions, what we do is we ask the motor units to kind of group up into uh, waves, and so when I ask the motor, the muscle to maybe hold steady, therefore maintain a level of contraction in a certain position, it might be that five motor units work to contract, and then the minute they go into their relaxation, another five units work, and then another five units, and in doing so, kind of like a um, like a running chain, you know, where somebody has to run to the top. Well. Every time there's a group of people in the contraction, those that are not contracting are recovering and getting ready for their turn to come up again. If we ask us, um, um, so if we ask the muscles to contract with pretty much a lot of force, maybe we can't generate like five or six groups of motor units. Maybe we only have three groups. And so the idea would be that the muscle might not be able to endure maintaining that position as long because the muscle fibers are in three groups and they have to take a turn over and over and over and over again. And so that leads to, again, the problems with fatigue setting in and um, not having enough ATP and not having enough acetylcholine and maybe the calcium handling isn't working as well. Um, and if, again, we ask the groups to be spread out amongst like 10 different groups, we might be able to do that activity for a really long period of time, okay? All right. Now, the last point was about muscle tone. So all of your muscles at any given second might have one or two motor units always in a state of contraction. And in this state of contraction, again, everybody, maybe one unit takes a turn. It allows there to be a background level of muscle contraction in every muscle of your body. And that's good for your posture muscles because they allow a little bit of oomph to that muscle that's maybe trying to hold your head up or hold your um, your torso in position, um, and we know that too much tone can potentially be a problem, so if we, in a given resting period, are asking too many motor units to give us a contraction and maintain that kind of level of tone, um, it might lead to um, maybe our muscles being stuck in a position that's then very hard to relax. So like the elbow joint, if the bicep is too much tone, we can't get the um, arm into a um, relaxed, long position. The elbow stays in the hinge, in the, uh, the hand close to the humerus bone. And so again, there's too much tone, so there's too many muscle fibers at any given second contracting in the bicep, causing the um, ulna and the radius to be pulled towards the humerus, whereas too little tone would mean that there's not enough muscle contracting it at any given second, and so maybe there's just too much loosey-goosey, you know, this to the um, muscle types, muscle fibers, okay? Now, switching gears a little bit. So we ask a muscle to contract, and when the cells contract, we know that they are going to shorten, and then in shortening, they are going to generate a force to be produced. 
But just because a few cells within a muscle are contracting, um, it doesn't always necessarily mean that every cell is shortening at any given period of time, OK? Now, when we ask a muscle to contract and the contraction overall leads to force production where the muscles do shorten, that's going to be a type of contraction known as a concentric contraction, all right? So concentric contractions are we ask the muscle to short, um, to contract, and when we do, the length of the muscle is going to become smaller, OK? Um, if we ask a muscle to contract, and in generating our contraction, the length of the muscle actually gets longer, even though force is being produced, that's called an eccentric contraction, right? So when you think about, like, climbing stairs, um, when you go up the stairs, you're doing a lot of concentric contractions. And then when you go down the stairs, that kind of like reaching with your foot, and you need to make your foot reach down to a longer or further away position from your hips, that's actually eccentric. Um, both of these contractions where muscles are changing length, whether they're getting shorter or longer, are known as um, isotonic contractions. So sometimes in books, they just want you to know if a muscle changes its length when it's contracting, then it's isotonic. If it gets longer, it's eccentric isotonic. If it gets shorter, it's concentric isotonic, OK? And you'll hear about eccentric isotonic contractions are like more damaging, so like running Downhill, they say, is like more hard or more damaging potentially to your muscles than running uphill. And so if you potentially ever did a marathon where, where a large portion of the marathon involves going downhill, um, that would potentially make you more sore the next day than a marathon that actually asks you to go uphill the whole time, OK? Um, if the contraction is being generated, but technically speaking, there's no change in the muscle length, that's an isometric contraction. And so the resting tone of our bodies is in some ways causing, is caused because isometric contractions are occurring. There's muscle cells that are contracting and generating force, and that generation of force is not seeing the entire muscle actually change in its shape. So the entire muscle is staying in the length of like five centimeters long, but some of the muscles in there are going through a contraction state that is maintaining a force production so you can hold that position of that muscle at that length. Right? So yoga does a lot of isometric contractions. So if you hold your push-up position, your biceps and your triceps are working to keep your torso and your head away from the ground, so that's isometric contractions. If you stand and, like, squat down in your knees, um, you know, you're going to be doing isometric contractions because you're trying to hold your body position in a knee and hip bend place, you know, like a squat place. Um, so there's isometric versus um, isotonic and then concentric, eccentric. So for like yoga poses, going into a yoga pose and coming out of a yoga pose involves eccentric and concentric contractions, but holding a yoga pose. So you're not technically asking the joints to move anymore. You're asking them to stay in the position that you've put them in. Those are going to be isometric contractions, all right? And again, if I ask myself to hold a position where I have to overcome a lot of gravitational forces or hold a very heavy weight, I'm going to need more of the muscle involved in that um, contraction for a given second. And so it might be that if I have a 1,000 muscle cells, I might only be able to make two groups of 500 have to contract, and then the next 500 have to contract, and then the next 500, you know, do it again. And when I ask lots of muscle cells like that to work at a high rate and a high turnover of maintaining the isometric contraction, I will probably start to shake and maybe fail faster than if I ask the muscle to hold a um, load in a position where it takes only 200 muscle fibers to do that. And so if I had 1,000 muscle fibers, I make five groups. And so by the time group A has to contract again, they've had a really nice recovery period to go back to their resting length, recuperate some of their fuel, their ATP, get back to their resting sarcomere position, and then generate that fiber 
contraction again. Okay. All right. So going into when we ask a muscle to relax, what exactly does that mean? All right. When we've asked the muscle to contract, the muscle has, like here, shown that so many, many, many of the muscle fibers. It doesn't necessarily mean all of the muscle fibers, but many, many, many of the cells have undergone, at the sarcomere level, the Z line to Z line has gotten closer together. And the area of overlap of actin and myosin proteins has, has increased, and the actin's been pulled towards the, the, um, the middle line of the sarcomere. Okay? Now, when I want this muscle to go back to its resting length, Part of what's going to happen is um, the calcium's not there, and troponin and tropomyosin are going to cover the actin binding site. And so we also know, remember in the sarcomere, there was a little squiggly protein known as triton. We also know that those pro other proteins have like a elasticity to them. And they actually want to go back, kind of like a spring, to a resting state. And so that's some of the elastic forces that we're going to see inside the cell, as well as the elastic membrane um, proteins in the ligaments and the tendons are going to also want to uncoil back to their resting position if they've been pulled um, downward or pulled upon. So between the sarcomere has some protein that kind of has a little um, coil, a little spring to it, and it wants to go back to a certain resting position. And every sarcomere doing this and every myofibril in a given cell is going to incur this kind of recoil ability to go back to a certain resting position. That's going to help the actin, um, the, the thin filaments kind of go back to a place where there's less overlap with the myosin. And we get back to that H band, that middle area where it's just the myosin protein and less overlap with actin. We're going to see at the muscle level the elastin proteins in the ligaments and tendons and the dense regular connective tissue and the perimyosin and the endomyosin help bring, again, the resting level to the muscle. Um, we know that relaxation also comes from opposing muscles. So you might have heard the term agonist is the muscle we're asking. So when I am trying to do elbow flexion, the bicep brachii is going to be my agonist. It's going to be the where we see muscle fibers contracting, motor units contracting, and it's causing the ulna and the radius to come closer to the humerus. Well, when I want to relax that muscle, somewhat is going to be relaxation of the biceps brachii, those elastic forces, the circle mirrors, when you're not asking them to contract, they're going to go back to their resting level. But some of it is also because the triceps um, brachii is going to contract and is going to, in some ways, help pull the bones away from the humerus. And in pulling away and extending the muscle, um, the bones away, the biceps brachii muscle is able to undergo a stretching or a lengthening activity as well. And then the third force that is going to help is gravity. So if I have gravity also in play, and this is why certain machines maybe have more efe efficient ability to work us than others, is because if we have to work against gravitational forces and then we use gravity to help us relax or stretch the muscle, that can sometimes give us a, a, um, a more, more workout in a given activity than others. So if you think about doing your biceps and triceps standing with the hands by your hips and then you try to bring your hands up to your shoulders, that's going to, again, have gravity help pull the hands back down towards your hips when it's time to extend. And, uh, and that's going to help the biceps brachii come back to a resting position. However, if I was doing this on a table and I don't necessarily um, have gravity coming into play, and I'm letting my arms lay flat on the table, and then I take my arms and I bring them to my um, shoulder, um, gravity's taken out a little bit, and so gravity will have less influence on getting the return to the resting tension, the resting level of the muscle, okay? So this is kind of showing you, um, again, this is a muscle fiber in its steady state position. If I add a little extra length with maybe adding an extra weight to pull on it, or maybe I add a little more gravitational force to pull on it, I can make the muscle lengthen. Then I can 
take that away and I can get the muscle to go back to its resting position for some of those elastic forces. If I ask the muscle to contract, it'll contract. And again, ultimately, I want this to come back to resting level. And again, the resting level for most muscles is because elastically there's some want to return to a certain point inside sarcomeres at a protein level inside a cell with all the sarcomeres and myofibrial level and then around the entire organ with some of the elastic properties in the connective tissue. Um, I enhance it again by using opposing muscles to help me again get a muscle to contract um, an opposite uh, force production than the muscle I'm trying to relax and then I have gravity that can come into play. Okay. So like think about a hamstring stretch. If you stand and you let your upper body fold into your lower leg, so you try to touch the floor with your um, hands where your feet are standing, you're using gravity to somewhat help you stretch in your hamstrings. But if you go on the ground and you sit um, with your feet out in front of you and then you try to touch your toes that way, gravity's not playing a role. So it might be that you don't stretch as much of the hamstring as you do when you have yourself standing upright and folding forward and trying to touch the floor with gravity, pulling your upper body down. Okay, so we've asked muscles to contract, we've asked cells to contract, we've asked cells to work as groups and maintain an isometric contraction, we've asked cells to contract and when they do the muscle shortens for a concentric contraction, we've asked cells to contract and the muscle technically still gets longer when that contraction is occurring and it's an eccentric contraction. So when we're asking cells to contract and maintain that state of contraction, we need to continually have energy, ATP, available for all the actin and myosin proteins that need to shorten and slide and then hold that position while calcium stays available. So one of the things we've learned with muscle fibers is that not every single muscle fiber is going to get their ATP in the same way. Some muscle fibers are made to do a better job at getting ATP um, without oxygen being involved and other muscle fibers are really good at getting ATP but having oxygen available um, and around. And so because of that, certain muscles take on a different characteristic because if a muscle doesn't need a lot of oxygen, um, it might be that that muscle is not going to be, ha it's going to have a lot of ATP for a very short period of time to generate a contraction, but it's not going to be able to continue to contract over and over and over for an endurance type situation. Versus if a muscle has a high ability to make ATP with aerobic mechanisms, it might be that that muscle can't from the initial onset generate a lot of force, but it can maintain a pretty decent amount of force production for a longer period of time. All right, and so understanding where ATP comes from in a muscle cell and which sometimes muscle cells like preferentially to use one system uh, more so than another is going to let us learn then why muscles um, like in a sprinter, like in Hussein Bolt, are extremely powerful and he runs the 100 meter dash super, super fast, but he isn't a miler or a marathoner. Um, and they look different and his muscles look different in his quadriceps and hamstrings and his body versus what it looks like in the marathon world. Um, and this converse co argument, why the marathoner maybe can run 100 yard dashes over and over and over and over and over again at a pretty dis decent speed and hold that speed, but he's not setting Hussein Bolt's world record. And again, because the way his energy and his muscle force production and endurance looks, his muscle cells in his quadriceps and hamstrings look pretty different. Okay? So the takeaway for you is that in most of our cells of the body, we do have a number of ATP molecules always kind of sitting ready to be utilized. And this muscle cell is no different. But that ATP within the cell that you have is only going to have enough ATP to bind to myosin, generate actin-myosin interactions for about a muscle activity for, to do something for about two seconds. So it's a muscle fiber contraction that will last maybe two seconds. So if you don't have another way to get ATP to continue to let that muscle fiber contract, then you will not be able to see the muscle contract again or sustain a contraction.
right? So another way in which we have ATP making ability is we have some molecules that bind phosphates and can give their phosphate back to an ADP, a diphosphate, and make 2 plus 1 is 3 and make ATP and do all of this in the cytoplasm of the cell without oxygen, without any real big complex um, processes and enzymes. And creatine phosphate falls into this category. So one of the reasons why you go to the muscle gym and they have whey powder, they have muscle powder, and they're like, do you want it to be creatine rich or do you want to buy some creatine fiber, fi you know, powder, um, is this whole theory of if I can get more creatine in my cells, then I have more molecules of creatine holding a phosphate ready to then donate to ADP to generate more ATP molecules. So if I have a thousand more creatine phosphate molecules and I'm trying to run a hundred yard dash, I'm potentially able to generate a hundred more ATP molecules than you are. And those ATP molecules that I have over you might be the difference between me running first place and you coming in second place. The other way we make ATP is through, again, some anaerobic processes, and this is where we start talking about fuel. Um, this is the breakdown of glucose from a six carbon molecule to a three carbon molecule. It's known as glycolysis. It takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell, and this is where in making glucose break down into pyruvate, which is basically taking a six carbon, cutting it in half, and making two three carbon molecules, we do actually, in the breaking of that carbon-carbon bond, um, generate two ATP. And while two ATP doesn't sound like a lot, if you think about all the glucose molecules you can potentially cut down into pyruvate, it can add up to be enough ATP, again, that lets me finish a half marathon, or not half marathon, an 800 meter dash or a 400 meter dash, maybe a split second before you do because I still have a few extra ATP available and you don't, so you start to hit the wall and the bear jumps on your back. And then aerobic production of ATP is going to be how fats, some proteins, and the pyruvate from glucose glycolysis breakdown all end up going into the mitochondria. We finish breaking down all those carbon-carbon bonds, generating carbon dioxide. But in breaking carbon-carbon bonds, um, we generate energy in the form of lots of ATP. Okay? Now, uh, this picture again is showing you that Certain cells are going to have a certain amount of ATP and creatine phosphate. And in, in general, most people have enough ATP, about 3 millimoles in their cytoplasm of their muscles, and that is enough ATP energy to ask a muscle to do something for about two seconds. So if you have an activity that needs two seconds, which is I see a spider, I, I scream, I jump up on the table, that's enough ATP. I don't actually need to use oxygen. I don't actually need to burn fuel. I have that ATP already ready, loaded, and cocked, and maybe helpful for getting the muscle to contract. Okay? If I need to, let's say, do a 100-meter dash, and I mean, most of us mere mortals, a 100-meter dash is going to take us about 15 to 20 seconds. So for most of us to try to run as fast as we can for 100 yards or 100 meters, the straightaway of a track, we are going to potentially hold our breath the whole time or not really breathe. And the reason why we can still get the muscles to turn over and generate a very high um, force production for that distance is because most of the muscles have that set ATP already there, and then they have the ability to make ATP very quickly by letting the creatine phosphate donate a phosphate to the ADP. So again, the ADP has two phosphates, really quickly add a third, and I get an ATP back. All right? For getting myself again to a um, 400 meter or an 800 meter, again, not really needing to breathe. I mean, I, I can kind of almost hold my breath for most of that event or that race. I am going to use glucose breakdown. 
In muscle cells, there is, again, we know from diabetes that glucose is brought into muscle cells and glucose is used to make energy. And in making the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate, we generate a few ATP molecules. So that's going to help us get um, that extra ATP going while once we run out of creatine phosphate and steady, you know, already available ATP. But the muscle is another organ in our system like the liver that will take glucose when it's kind of excess and can convert it and store it as a molecule known as glycogen, right? And part of what you do with training for endurance and even just um, moderate middle distance is you train your body to use your glycogen. So glycogen gets broken down into glucose molecules and then glucose gets broken down into pyruvate, but your body will start to be stimulated with training to store more glycogen in the muscle. And so that way, the next time you ask it to run an 800 meter dash or a half mile, it has, instead of 1,000 glycogen molecules, maybe it has 1,100 glycogen molecules. And so with last time you were able to run the 800 and maintain your pace for three minutes, well, because you have an extra 100 glycogen molecules now, you're able to go a little faster for a little longer, and you actually finish the half mile in two minutes and 50 seconds, you know? So that's kind of the advantage of having more glycogen in your muscle, all right? The aerobic metabolism, this is the whole thing of I might not be able to get a maximal force produced from all of my muscle cells, but if I ask the muscle cells to work over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, I'm going to get a consistent amount of force production from those cells that's going to let me do this activity for a very long period of time. And that's, again, where we see the 10-miler, the 6-miler, um, you know, things that you can do in about an hour to an hour and a half. You're going to have enough energy um, from the breakdown of that glycogen glycolysis product pyruvate to go into the mitochondria with some fat breakdown um, in the muscle cells and in other areas to, again, generate enough ATP to continuously let the muscle rotate through a cycle of contraction, relaxation, but the muscle as an organ is constantly able to produce enough force over and over and over again for that activity, okay? Now, just to kind of get your bearings, we tend to focus on glucose um, in muscle cells as the preferred fuel, and the reason why is because if you take glucose, which is six carbons, and you cut it in half, you generate two ATP, and that process is glycolysis. Um, glucose in muscle can be stored as glycogen, so muscle has the ability to keep glucose handy. Normally, if you have too much glucose and you don't use it in other cells, it gets sent to the liver and to the fat, um, of your body and gets converted into fat. So very few places actually can store glucose in its stored form of glycogen, and um, that's part of the reason why. If I eat a low um, fat diet, but I eat thousands and thousands of calories over what I need of carbohydrates, so if I decided, oh, I'm going to be a vegetarian and I'm just going to eat bread and pasta every day, but I eat 5,000 calories of bread and pasta every day, um, I might still see my body fat percentage come up with time, and it's because all that excess glucose is going to be converted to fat, okay? Now, fat, glucose, and proteins all enter into aerobic metabolism right here as a two-carbon molecule, and they go into the mitochondria. So aerobic glycolysis or aerobic generation, um, aerobic metabolism, sorry, aerobic generation of ATP can come from a variety of fuels, all right? So this is why if I eat a low-carb diet, which is the, the Atkins, you know, zone, certain diets, they have different plans, your goal is that if you don't give the body the carbohydrates, it's got to make fuel from other fuels, it's got to make ATP somehow, so you're going to end up burning more of your fat and more of your protein to make that ATP because you don't have glucose, the preferred fuel for uh, making ATP, okay? Now, um, this is just, again, giving you more inputs on the different names, so aerobic metabolism, 
is going to be what your muscles are using in maintaining tone. So you're not asking the muscle cell to do a lot. So the oxygen that's coming in normal capillary flow at a resting muscle is just a little bit of oxygen. And that little bit of oxygen is taken in. And some of those fatty acids are broken down into two carbon pieces and are put through the mitochondria. And in the presence of that oxygen, energy is maintained. And you make energy ATP. And then as you need that cell to have its ATP available to contract to be part of muscle tone, there's ATP present. Okay. If you start asking the muscle to work a little bit, um, you're going to need to make more um, pyruvate molecules and more two carbon molecules from fat. And fat is great at giving you a certain number, but it can't potentially be an infinite number because you have to get it and from the fat cells and then bring it over to the muscle. So that's why, again, glucose becomes important and protein becomes important because those are other quick ways to get more two carbon molecules. You max out your, your mitochondria and their ability to take two carbon molecules and make energy. But the thing about glucose is as long as I have glucose or glycogen, I can continue to make a little extra, a little lanyap, a little bit of extra fuel because breaking down glucose to pyruvate gives me extra fuel. Now it's a slippery slope because if I start making too much uh, glucose broken down into pyruvate and I max out all of the entry points for um, the mitochondria, all of that pyruvate will start to accumulate, and that's where I'll end up making lactic acid. Okay. So for the most part, muscle, every cell in your body has the ability to have a steady state number of ATP, have a little creatine phosphate, have the ability to break down glucose to pyruvate for glycolysis and generate a little energy, and then utilize fat, protein, and, and pyruvate for the mitochondria part. All right? And normally, when you ask cells to do their normal function, they can basically make do with background levels of fat breakdown and a little bit of glucose if it's available, but mostly just breakdown of fat as um, the fuel source. Okay, so that's why if you ever do like a, a functional test with they when they put the mask on you and they they tell you to sit there for a minute and they just let you breathe a few breaths, they you'll see looking at the carbon dioxide coming out and the amount of oxygen coming in that you're in the fat burning zone. Or if you go to the um, gym and you push on a treadmill or an elliptical that you want to do a, a workout that's going to burn fat, the intensity is not very much to that workout because you want the muscles to work at a rate that they don't need a lot of energy output in a short period of time. So the fat burning is sufficient for that. Okay, So going to walk a lot every day, this is why the whole 10,000 steps, um, you know, you're asking people to do like a normal, not necessarily intense activity, but you ask them to do a lot of it in the day, that should help them burn fat. Okay, When you start asking for someone to do a little bit more uh, activity, so it means a little bit more force production from the organs, so that means a little bit more number-wise of muscle fibers maybe working together to produce force, and then within the muscle fibers you're asking it maybe to produce that force over and over and over again for the activity, your amount of ATP that you get from fat burning through the mitochondria is not going to be sufficient. So that's why you're going to need to utilize more sources of energy and you start to see the breakdown of glucose to pyruvate giving you that extra bump in ATP, okay? Um, plus the normal breakdown of fat that gives you ATP and then that pyruvate to keep it from accumulating, you're going to start sending it. And so think about like lanes of traffic or lanes of um, checkout at Walmart. So if it starts to be moderately busy, they start opening more lanes. So think about the mitochondria is the number like five checkout lanes per mitochondria. Well, when you're just burning fat for background, resting, or light, you know, normal activity, maybe for every mitochondria, one lane of traffic is open. So one checkout is open for every five checkouts. And so you're able to burn a normal background amount of energy and fuel to make energy. But when it starts to be, let's say, prime time, you know, when is prime time, like, um, 
you know, Saturday afternoon when everybody goes to the grocery store at the same time? Well, it might be because you're asking the the um, environment to produce more energy and there's more force and there's more expectation and energy get required, you ask every mitochondria to open three lanes of traffic. And one of those lanes of traffic is the fat that's continuing to be burned, but the other two lanes of traffic start to be the pyruvate that you're generating from glycolysis. All right? And so you're getting some extra fuel from other breakdown and other energy making mechanisms that don't require oxygen and so your mitochondria kind of help continue to burn that extra pyruvate fuel. And in doing so, you get more energy and you're able to maintain that moderate intensity and moderate activity for a period of time. Okay. Um, and then if you start asking for a lot of activity, again, you ask the the mitochondria to open up all its lanes of traffic, you start putting pyruvate as fast as you're making it from the breakdown of glycogen and glucose to be burned, and it just so happens that um, the mitochondria are maxed out and you still have a backlog of line, so some of that pyruvate starts to try to find other ways to check out, so they go to the garden center and the photo center and the jewelry counter, but in doing so, they're being checked out as lactate, so they are um, not giving you quite the same amount of energy and they're generating a waste product as well. All right? So that's kind of how muscles work. So again, if you want to really burn a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of energy, you do a peak activity, a high intensity activity, but you're not going to be able to do that for more than maybe 30 minutes. So if you want to do a decent amount of burn and you want to do it for a sustained hour or two hours, you know, you do moderate activity. And then if you just want to try to do normal function and burn fat, you might be able to do this for all day or five or six hours because it's low intensity and you're going to burn a lot of fat because you're not asking the system to generate a high amount of ATP in a given second. Okay, I have a student here, so I'm going to stop recording at this point, and I'll pick up in a little while um, and finish this, okay?